Hello, my smart and talented friends, and welcome to the Global Science Network. I am going to show you how to build an artificial synapse using an optocoupler, which is super cool. In upcoming videos, I will show you how to build artificial neurons and an artificial neural network on breadboards. At the end of this artificial neuron video series, I plan to announce a design competition to have you help improve these designs. First, let's talk about how a synapse works and then discuss how to build an artificial synapse. A neuron has a cell body and the branches coming off are called dendrites and an axon. The dendrites receive signals from other neurons and integrate these signals within the body of the cell. Once a voltage threshold is reached within the cell body, the cell becomes depolarized and an action potential travels down the axon. Here are eight neurons firing. Each neuron has thousands of synapses. We can zoom in and take a closer look at one chemical synapse. A chemical synapse starts with a presynaptic terminal which comes from the axon side of the transmitting neuron. There is a small gap called the synaptic cleft and on the other side of the gap there is a postsynaptic dendritic spine on the receiving neuron. You might be wondering how does the signal actually get sent across the synapse? When the action potential, which is an electrical signal, enters the presynaptic terminal, it causes a chain of events to occur. First, it causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, and calcium ions enter the presynaptic terminal. The calcium that enters the presynaptic terminal attaches to vesicles, which are packs of neurotransmitters. This activates proteins, which cause the vesicles to fuse with proteins at the presynaptic terminal membrane. This fusion of membranes releases the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters then diffuse and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane of the dendritic spine. This causes the chemically gated ion channels to open, causing ions to flow into the dendritic spine, which is electrically connected to the dendrites and cell body. If the channel allows positively charged sodium ions to pass, it makes the neuron more likely to fire, which is an excitatory response. If the channel allows negatively charged chlorine ions to pass, it makes the neuron less likely to fire, which is an inhibitory response. The channel opening could also cause positively charged potassium ions to leave the dendritic spine, which is also an inhibitory response. When the dendrite receives the ions, it does not create an action potential, which is how axons send electrical signals. Within the dendrites, the electrical signals are called excitatory postsynaptic potentials or inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. The dendrites in cell body are filled with a fluid called cytoplasm, and all of these structures are electrically connected. The ions that enter the dendrites diffuse quickly to distribute the voltage within the dendrites and cell body of the neuron. When the voltage at the axon hillock exceeds the threshold voltage, which is usually around negative 55 millivolts, the cell will fire and an action potential will travel down the axon. To summarize this, when a neuron fires, it sends out an electrical signal telling all the synapses to fire. When the signal reaches the presynaptic terminal, neurotransmitters are released, which bind to receptors on the dendritic spine. Ion channels will then open or close, resulting in charge being transferred across the receiving cell. When the integration of charge reaches the threshold voltage of around negative 55 millivolts, the cell will fire. At birth, a human is born with around 86 billion neurons. This is cool because before a baby is born, it creates an average of 3,500 neurons per second. Then, once a person is born, the number of neurons does not significantly change over the entire lifespan. However, the number of synapses does change significantly. At birth, each neuron has around 2,500 synapses. At age 2, this increases and peaks to around 15,000 synapses per neuron. From age 3 to 4, the number of synapses reduces to around 10,000. At age 5 to 18, the number slowly reduces to around 5,000. And from 18 to 50, the number of synapses is stable at around 5,000 synapses per neuron. From age 50 onward, there is a gradual decline in the number of synapses. This is a very broad estimate and the number of synapses per neuron varies significantly based on the region of the brain. My main takeaway from the reduction of synapses, especially early in life, is that one way the brain learns is by reducing the number of synapses. This is a rigid way of learning, which makes the brain have less total options, but hopefully reduces the network in a favorable way. For example, motor tasks, like walking or moving your arms and fingers, needs to be learned early on and further learning is not generally needed. This means that synapses in the motor control regions of the brain that are not used will likely be eliminated early on in life. The brain can also learn by adding different receptors and ion channels to the postsynaptic membrane of the dendritic spine. As a synapse is repeatedly activated, the synapse strength can be increased in what is known as long-term potentiation. When this happens, different ion channels change how much charge is transferred to the cell, 
which can change the neuron firing pattern and thus changing the logic of the network. Now let's talk about how optocouplers work, which I use to build artificial synapses. This optocoupler is built with two LEDs. The first LED shines light onto the second LED, which acts like a solar cell. In order to get a five volt output with high current, the power generated by the LED solar cell needs to be amplified and buffered using two transistors. This optocoupler now acts like a relay where when the input is on, the output is on. To turn this into an artificial synapse, all we need to do is add a diode and some type of resistor to control how much current is sent out. This resistor can be a basic resistor, potentiometer, or a memristor. This artificial synapse has an inverting buffered input, optocoupler, and an amplified buffered output that is then connected to a diode and resistor. The resistor value is what controls how much charge is sent out. Here is a circuit diagram showing how to build this circuit. A synapse built this way is an excitatory synapse. Around 20 to 30 percent of synapses are inhibitory. This artificial synapse can be turned into an inhibitory synapse by adding a transistor which connects the capacitor to ground when the synapse is on, which will reduce the charge rather than add charge. The resistor in this case controls how much charge will be removed when the synapse is active. Here are three artificial neurons. The first neuron has an inhibitory synapse, the second neuron has an excitatory synapse, and the third neuron receives its input from the other two neurons. If the inhibitory neuron is disconnected, the receiving neuron firing rate increases. If the inhibitory neuron is then reconnected, the firing rate of the receiving neuron decreases. The artificial neural network will take an input from sensors and hopefully output a useful response. Having the option to increase or reduce the firing rate of neurons will be very useful in controlling the logic of the network. An optocoupler can be built many different ways. The transmitting side can be an LED or an infrared LED. The receiving side can be an LED, photodiode, phototransistor, or light-dependent resistor. Since we will be using lots of optocouplers, the easiest way to implement them is with an IC. Within the IC, the optocoupler is built with an infrared LED and a phototransistor. Here is a circuit diagram for making an artificial synapse with an IC optocoupler. Let's look back at how the artificial synapse is built compared to the biological synapse. The optocoupler receives an electrical input signal to turn on, just like action potentials are received at the axon terminal. The artificial synapse emits light across the junction, just like neurotransmitters are released across the junction. Light is received by the yellow LED, which allows current to flow into the body of the neuron, in this case, a capacitor. For a neuron, the neurotransmitters are received by receptors of the chemically gated ion channel, which allows ion channels to open and transfer charge into the body of the neuron. For the artificial synapse, the amount of charge transferred depends on the resistor value. For a biological synapse, the amount of charge transferred depends on the number of channels and types of ion channels that open. So a big question is whether this artificial synapse is functionally equivalent to biological synapses. If not, how do we make them functionally equivalent? Right now, the optocoupler is basically acting like a buffer, and I'm not sure that it actually plays a role in the computation. However, the amount of light transmitted out could function in a similar way as sending more or less neurotransmitters. Also, the transmitting side could emit different wavelengths or colors of light to tell the receiving side to transfer different amounts of charge, just like different neurotransmitters open different types of ion channels. The light interaction within the cell could also help change properties in neuromorphic designs. An artificial synapse built this way is very basic. It is functional, but is mostly built for demonstration purposes. The holy grail of an artificial synapse would be a structure that initially forms and makes connections based on genetic information. A large number of synapses would form to create a highly connected network. Synapses that are not used would weaken or be eliminated, and synapses that are frequently used would be strengthened by lowering the output resistance. Inhibitory synapses would need to be able to remove charge from the cell, not just send less charge. Different synapses would need to be able to adapt and change firing patterns based on genetic information within the cell. To be functionally equivalent to biological cells, the synapse needs to transfer a proportional number of states to the postsynaptic neuron. It also needs to be able to change how much information is sent based on input activations to allow the network to learn and behave in an equivalent way. The transistor is currently the most commonly built human structure or component, as billions of these are needed to build a single computer. Someday the artificial synapse will likely pass the transistor and will be the most commonly built component other than the subcomponents that are repeatedly used to build an artificial synapse. 
Either way though, the artificial synapse should actually have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people working on it. Right now, the importance of an artificial synapse is largely overlooked. To watch the next video in the series about how to build artificial neurons, click here.